Hello, good afternoon. Today our guest is Professor Eric Anushek. Hello, Professor. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. And yourself? I'm great, and you are looking great. You look quite elated. So I'm guessing that you have been looking forward to, to this interview for some time. I have. It's been <laughs> on the schedule, but I blocked off the whole afternoon for it. Great. So, Professor, we're going to be talking about education because you are known for your articles and commentaries on education, school quality, and development. And this is the first question. Do early childhood interventions matter be important? Well, I think they're very important. Um, you know, the education is a continuous process and people build on what they know in the past. And so the earlier learning that people have, the more they have to build on and it uh, carries through in uh, much of schooling. But do they always work? The early childhood prog programs as opposed to the learning, uh, no. I, I think that um, there is variation in formal programs in the same way that there's a lot of variation in formal schooling. And so sometimes they're really effective and sometimes they aren't. Um, and that's something to always pay attention to. All right, Professor, you have also written on IQ. Recently, I read an online blog published by academics and they were arguing that interventions are important and significant irrespective of the time when these interventions occur. So even if the interventions occur later in childhood, provided that they're quality interventions, they will still work. But some are skeptical of early childhood intervention to groans. Is this argument based on serious data? Well, I mean, I, I think what people have looked at is a wide variety of uh, programs and interventions, and there is a variation in the outcomes. Um, I think it's true that um, everything else being equal, that uh, early inventions are better than later uh, interventions. Um, you know, I wish I'd learned how to ski when I was young, as opposed to when I was later, because I could have built on that and I'd be a much better skier today. Professor, all important our genes? Well, I, I think that that's still a matter of debate about genes per se. There's a lot of um, both research on various aspects of this and a lot of rhetoric on it. Um, I think that there are important genetic factors. I don't think there's any way to deny that. The question is, um, uh, how, how much does do genes per se change outcomes? And there, I think that there's a more open question because the literature I see looks a lot at the interactions of genetics and the environment. And so it's hard to separate out just what different genes mean as opposed to a combination of uh, genes and the environment. All right, then. Let me give an example. If one is not from a stimulating intellectual background and this person did not inherit genes that are sufficiently correlated with educational attainment, what type of early what type of programs should be designed to assist such an individual? Well, I, th I think with anybody, it, it, independent of how they got there, that the best educational programs, in fact, uh, pick up on what the people know and where they're at. Um, in fact, uh, if you look around the world at schooling interventions, um, some are very effective at um, picking up on the knowledge of incoming students, whereas others uh, ignore what students, students know beforehand and often don't get very good results because they are not dealing with the basic skills that the person brings to the school. And I think that that holds in all kinds of interventions that um, uh, you know, 
if you talk about early childhood or later childhood, what we see is that um, you have to have programs that try to build on the skills that people have and to develop more skills. Professor, you have written extensively on schooling. What is the quality school? What are the ingredients for a, quali for, for a school to operate at a high level? Is school autonomy important? Is teacher quality important? What are the relevant variables? Well, I'd, I'd start with saying that um, uh, from the research I've seen about schools, the uh, most important factor by far is the effectiveness of the teacher. Um, that differences among teachers have huge impacts on the learning uh, of students. Now, the, the difficulty there is that we have trouble identifying beforehand what, uh, what are the qualities that lead to an effective teacher. I think teachers have come from a variety of backgrounds with a variety of characteristics and training, and we haven't identified very well specifics. But we know that individual teachers um, vary dramatically in their effectiveness. Um, and so that's clearly important. Um, I, I think that what, what I would take away from both the US literature and the international literature is that you have to set the right institutional environment that has an incentives to make sure that there are effective teachers in all classrooms and that ineffective teachers don't stay around for too long. I agree with you, Professor. It should be easy to hire and fire teachers. <laughs> yes, sir. A school is not a business, but students are important. They're literally the future, both, both literally and metaphorically, students represent the future. And the type of schooling that we up to support can affect developmental outcomes. So when I was a student, I would say that I had fairly good teachers. They not only taught the important quality and quantitative skills, but also social skills. So one of my teachers, she went to an event once and she said, another teacher was telling a student that our teacher is true because she heard it on the TV and she, wasn't listen she was not listening to an academic program at the time. So teaching is really important. And no I doubt about it. I think, think you've hit it right on the head that um, it's hard to, hard to get around the fact that good teachers really have had an influence on each of us. But school accountability, we often say that teacher than principal be accountable. But years ago, in 2005, you did a paper titled, The School Accountability Lead to Improve Student Performance. And this is what we want to know. Yes, intuitively, accountability sounds good. But does it really make sense based on what you have studied over the years? Well, I think so. I, I don't think there's any doubt about it that um, school systems that have better accountability based upon student learning are uh, more effective than others. Now, that having been said, uh, accountability by itself will not explain all of the variation across schools or across countries in learning. Um, what we know is that it has a very valuable effect um, and that uh, the best example, the one that's gotten the most attention is the US national attention to No Child Left Behind. Um, no Child Left Behind was started by the federal government in 2000 official. Um, it didn't do that, but what it did do was to you come back. Hello? Hello. 
Hello? Yes, you've, you've come back. Yes, I have come back. Unfortunately, there was an issue with the internet, so you are speaking. Well, all right, would you like to start over? I can, uh, um, we're talking about accountability. And yes, accountability. accountability, all right, so you can continue. Um, and <clears throat> there we, um, as I said, no Child Left Behind actually had positive impacts on student achievement. Um, but that was kind of surprising because in my opinion, No Child Left Behind was not well conceived. It uh, was a federal law that told states to decide what they were going to teach what the, or what students should learn at each grade and then to test whether these goals were being met. But if they didn't meet the specific goals, the federal government would tell the schools how to change what it was doing. And in my opinion, that was entirely backwards. Uh, the federal government ought to be saying what the learning goals are for all the students in the US. And um, if they don't achieve it, it should be up to the schools to figure out how to change it. And the schools should be deciding how to improve things, not the federal government. I agree. Now, Professor Anushek, would you describe yourself as a perfectionist? I know I'm asking this question. Well, I, I don't know. I'm, I believe in, I'm pretty much toward a perf being a per perfectionist, but not completely. Okay. Now, I'm asking this question because I like to produce a quality program and sometimes Zoom can become quite inefficient. Like a couple of minutes ago when we were both blocked out and whenever this ha happened, you, some, usually I would move on, but I often explain to the guests that it's not something that I appreciate. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a film of technology and as somebody who likes to, I like when things are done properly, whenever Zoom becomes a problem, it really ticks me off. <laughs> yes, I, I have to agree with you that there are, are problems. Um, it's a pretty stable, stable uh, program, actually, except that the internet that all of us have to deal with can be less the program itself. Yes, like te technology is good, but it can fail us. I remember once I was speaking to this economist and we had to start over. The second time we didn't start over again, but he's background was just really awful and luckily for us when i posted the video people didn't comment on that <laughs> <laughs> yes I, I i wonder why but we're going to talk about autonomy so some argue that autonomous schools are more effective and they advocate decentralization this is also an era of research you have written on the topic does school mm -hmm. autonomy make sense um <clears throat> I think it does within bounds. What you want to do is make sure that the schools are doing what you want them to do <laughs> so that um, you can't just go out to somebody in school and say, do whatever you want to do, that'll be good. You have to say, we're looking for students to be learning at the end of grade five, and we're going to measure their performance by the math and reading that they can do. Um, now we would like you, the school, to figure out how best to do that. And in that situation, I think autonomy is very powerful because people can take advantage of their own strengths and, and the own weaknesses of students to pay attention to that. Um, but it has to be done within the context of uh, making sure that people are doing uh, what you want the schools to do. And the socioeconomic status also plays an important role. So I remember your study and in the study, it was noted that the impacts are different based on the level of development. And as somebody who lives in a developing country, I can tell you that poorer countries have a capacity problem. So. In Jamaica, one particular high school has a school excellence model, and that high school is able to use the metrics determined by that model to gauge its performance, but other schools have a capacity problem. 
So there's an inspector, the NEI, and the NEI is responsible for inspecting schools. But based on the quality of the school, people respond differently to the recommendation. So capacity is important. No, there's no doubt about that. You, you've really hit uh, on an important point is that um, <clears throat> both the capacity of the students coming into the school and the capacity of the school to add to their learning um, are really important. And you can't um, ignore the fact that there are variations there and that we want in, in general to have high quality, but we don't always get that. And people were exposed to superior practices are better able to serve our students. So I remember a principal telling me that she understands the budgeting process. And that's important because schools are managing huge sums. So if you're going to encourage schools to be autonomous, one has to provide the relevant training. So again, because I'm from Jamaica, there is an institution called ENCEL, the National College for Educational Leadership. It trains principals, but I think that it should also train specialists and middle managers because management is important. And if you are the head of a department in a school, you're also a manager. No doubt about it. There's, um, you know, schooling is a very complicated business. I mean, classroom teaching is one of the most uh, complicated and difficult activities that you can think of. And running a school means taking care of both different classrooms, classrooms, plus all of the business aspects that you talk about. And Professor, I'm 28 and you're an older person, but older people like to stay in our time, you either went to school or you acquired a trade. And luckily for people in my generation, trades pay. I read a story recently about a young man is younger than 25, but he bought a house because he's a successful tradesman. Trades pay. Why don't we encourage more people to acquire a skill? Well, I think that um, ultimately people have to develop skills to work effectively in different parts of the economy. There's no doubt about that. Um, the question is how specific should schooling be um, to train people with these skills? And <clears throat> I think that here there's a lot of controversy. Uh, right now, there are places that emphasize almost entirely vocational education, which are specific skill-driven uh, activities. And then there are some that, uh, that don't try to provide any specific skills at all, but provide general kinds of skills. I actually lean more toward the latter, um, toward more general skills, because I worry with economic development and progress, uh, no matter where you're at, whether you're in Jamaica or in the United States or, or any place else, um, the economy is gonna change over the lifetime. And people have to be ready to adjust and adapt to that. I worry that if skills are too specific in schooling, people aren't um, ready to adapt when the demand for specific skills changes. So that when, uh, when cars are no longer made by people walking around with screwdrivers and wrenches, but in fact are made by robots, the skills that are needed change from manual skills to ones of running iPads and, and other quality control kinds of ideas. And this is why the skill of adaptability is so important. So I have a colleague, she has several degrees, but every now and then she, she will do a short course to upgrade her skills. And we're talking about adaptability. So mm -hmm. yeah, one has a degree in engineering, but the advertising sector may expand therefore it makes sense to respond and acquire new skills absolutely that's um you know the people that succeed are ones who are quite adaptable because at all points in time people are doing different things it's very seldom that you'll find somebody who's doing exactly the same thing i mean even down to uh if we think about carpenters and putting together wooden structures. Well, that's changed actually a lot. I just had some work done at our house and essentially nobody uses a hammer anymore around here. They have a, a compressed air 
gun that does all the nailing for them. And things are just constantly changing and people have to be ready to adapt. It's recently I read an article published by the Harvard Business Review and the writer, she explains the process of upskilling. So one must always be in the business of acquiring and refining new skills. I have a friend, she's a management consultant and she, 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 mm -hmm. she would often say to me, Lipton, I like to retool. Right. You have well, to I be relevant. That's, that's right. No, I think that, that um, you know, that's uh, what you see um, when I look at the economy is that the people who have more general education in schooling are often better able at picking up new skills. They're prepared to um, find how they find out how to learn new skills. They're prepared to read on their own or go to courses on their own. They're prepared to look around and see what needs to be changed. And so this leads to part of the return to having more education is that just the ability to pick out what skills you're going to need in the future and move toward those. But we're going to talk now about a more contemporary issue, Professor, resources. When you were a young man in high school or primary school, back then there wasn't a computer, but students were able to assimilate well and acquire knowledge like my own grandmother. She likes to do mental calculations in her head. But today people often say resources are important. But older people, Eric, you guys are just so smart. You're always doing mental calculations in your head. So are resources really that important? Are, um, <laughs> I don't know. You're, you're absolutely correct that um, uh, I can probably do more mental math problems than you can. Yes. I, that's, that's just a guess. Um, um, I think that we've changed some of the ways that we go about teaching, but what we're um, trying to, to get across in general education is some more general analytical abilities. So I have some analytical abilities when presented with various numerical problems, but there are other analytical capacities. When I just turn on my computer, what, what program am I gonna use? And if I bring up Excel, uh, what am I gonna do with it to solve a problem I have? And so the, the exact form of these uh, problems has changed and the teaching has changed, but I think that the underlying idea has remained relatively constant. But sometimes I wonder, why is it that some young people have such bad memories? So every now and then I read articles penned by young people and they will say, I went to school for seven years and I was never taught A and B. And then I meet somebody who's over 80 and that person didn't finish high school, but he can remember what he was taught as a, as a primary school student. So what's going on? <laughs> Um, I, I shouldn't talk about my memory at this point. So, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that, that that's a good good one. I, don't, I actually don't think that um, schooling is best to teach memory skills, or I don't think it's best to teach rote skills. Um, and so there are some, if you hit on some rote skills that somebody learned in schooling, they might remember them more. They're, they're conditioned to do standardized routine things without changing them. Um, but as a general rule, I don't think school uh, works on memory per se. So Professor, what are we doing differently today? So despite our resources and the, the quality of our teachers, and by quality, I'm referring to the accumulation of new degrees, it is not unusual for people to graduate schools not knowing how to read and write. In Jamaica, this was a big problem for several years. And there's that book, Why Can't Johnny Read? What are we doing differently? Why? And again, I must ask the question. My peers, why are so many young people unable to string a sentence together? What's going on? Well, I think that there are um, huge quality problems in all over and that some um, 
some children neither get the learning from home nor from school and it leads to these great divergences at any point in time and i'm not sure that it's so much young versus old as wide differences in what people at any point in time have learned or are, are capable of doing brilliant response let me tell you why i say it's brilliant when i was a student many of my teachers prior to teaching they had exposure in the in the private sector so they could transmit actual human capital and i remember my exams being like logic test so one paper was over 11 pages the mathemat the math the papers for mathematics were, were really hard and the, there was a subject called personal development and in that subject we were taught the importance of interpersonal relationships self-control punctuality because in the world of work, one must know how to relate with his peers and application is important. So our teachers would say frequently, learn how to apply knowledge. If you get an exam and the question seems strange, that is not a problem, apply knowledge. And after graduating, I recognized that some of my peers, even if they studied Spanish or literature, they could get a job in the private sector. And I would meet young people with degrees in actual science and no one would employ them. So human capital is different from education. Education is content. Human capital is a technical skill. So education is getting the degree in engineering. Human capital is starting the engineering business or filing the patent that is useful. Well, I, I wouldn't go quite so far in the definition of human capital. I think it's the collection of skills that are valuable. Um, and the analogy is made to machinery, physical capital. In fact, that was when the, the term, term was first coined human capital, people objected to it on moral grounds that we shouldn't think of people as machines. Um, but I, I think that was a sort of silly kind of argument that, that's gone away. But what human capital means to me is a collection of skills that are useful in uh, doing the task of both work and living. Yeah, let me, let me tell you this story. It's about a soft skill. A young woman was doing a job interview and prior to starting, her prospective boss placed a broom in front of her and she stepped over the broom. Did she get the job? No. So soft skills, again, are really important. When you're teaching students, you, you, you can't be abstract. You need to demonstrate how these soft skills make sense in the real world. My One of my teachers, she told me about her daughter. So her daughter wanted to work at a bank. And the, those wicked bank managers created a fake exercise. And she was graded. But she didn't know that the exercise was fake. But she passed it because of her social skills. Well, um... We've just recently started to talk more about social skills. Um, I, to me, it means that there's a wide range of skills that are valuable. Um, we don't understand the, the full range or, or don't know how to measure or analyze the full range. We've been measuring what are often labeled just cognitive skills uh, and general analytical skills. Um, <clears throat> But I think that there's a whole range of these things that interact. Um, uh, I don't think that people with just social skills and no cognitive skills are going to do succeed very well. Not at all. As I, as I just the opposite. I don't think people with strong cognitive skills, but or negative negative social skills, um, are also going to have trouble succeeding. So. Um, it's a it's a package that we analytically uh, don't know how to actually define very well. We're we're trying to do better at measuring and identifying uh, the kinds of skills that are important in different circumstances, uh, but we're not there quite yet. On this show, I keep saying to people that emotional intelligence is a consequence of cognitive ability and there was a study done by non-european academics and these writers 
they look at the relationship between cognitive ability and emotional intelligence and it's a positive relationship if you're an, if you are intelligent then clearly you're going to know how to temper hostility with kindness i i think that the that's partly what i was trying to get at and i think you said it very well is that there are these interactions that are really important and <clears throat> we can't quite distinguish the separate little tiny components of this package of skills, but that there are multiple dimensions that are going to be important all the time. Yeah, yeah. and let me give another Kerbin example. And, and, and on this show, we're, we're serious about human capital and our human capital is applied in knowledge. So you are Eric Anushek, you produce academic studies and we distill them. So it's applied knowledge, the Kerbin again. Performing arts, entrepreneurship, logistics and supply chain, management, management of business, computer science, digital, digital and media technology. All of these fancy subjects are taught in the Caribbean at the upper level. And teachers and, employer, and, and employers complain that students are unemployable. And, and to these people, I say the issue is really human capital and know-how. So one of the degree in marketing as a marketing student, you're going to do statistics and economics. So if there is a job opening in agriculture as an agricultural research officer, you should reply because research officers are usually adept at, at, at statistics and economic research. So again, it's, it's about application of knowledge. And this is where I see many developing countries falling down. They have declarative knowledge, but not procedural knowledge. And this is because of Orlando Patterson. He introduced the terms to me in one of his studies. So countries like Jam Jamaica are aware of the know-how, but they don't know how to translate it into actual human capital. So you're teaching students performing arts, tourism, all of these fancy subjects, but they're still unemployable. Why? Because of the know-how. And again, as I said, many of my teachers prior to teaching worked in the private sector. So they knew how to transmit capital. I, I think it's... Um... You're absolutely right that, that it is the application. Um, but partly, uh, I think that we shouldn't um, put all of the load onto schools. Uh, other, other institutions in society, just society in general, is also important in uh, both identifying skills that are important and uh, rewarding them and convincing people that they should learn them and, and adapt to them. Um, and you see this across different cultures, both developing and developed, where there are certain local uh, skills that are demanded uh, that if you don't have them, you don't do very well. And if you have them, you do well. And so that, um, I think, is a general rule. I'm, I'm happy that we're talking about institutions. So churches were once very important. In some places today, they're still important and NGOs are equally important. But to, to, today we're operating under a different framework. I don't know if many teachers and parents really appreciate the role of the NGO sector in fostering academic achievement. I'm not aware. Well, I, I think that, that's right. There are all these other institutions that, that play a part. I mean churches do still play a, an important part in many parts of the world and many many local areas. Um, but there are also other um, NGOs in developing countries in particular that might be important, but there are also the same sort of nonprofit institutions um, in the United States that uh, have an impact. <laughs> The million dollar question is coming up and we touched on it a, a bit earlier. Are, student, are schools shaped by manual practices or the quality of the students? So Robert Plowman, he's big on genes and he has a paper saying that genes are really important. It, the schools really matter that much. What's your take? Well, I think that that overstates the case. I think that and, and other outside of school things are really important, but I think schools themselves are very important. Um, that's my own, own impression from uh, where I've gotten to today is that it was a combination of my family and probably some genetics. I don't know about that, but at least of the different schools I've gone to 
that have been uh, combined to be important in my life. What were your teachers like? They were highly variable. Some of them were uh, not very good. I <laughs> remember my, I had a biology teacher in uh, high school that came in and read out of a book to us, um, which was not very effective. Um, it, and then on the other hand, I've had a couple teachers that have inspired me greatly, um, not so much in their specific teaching to me, but in sort of setting the framework of what I do and how I think about problems. And what about your parents? What did they transmit? Well, my parents were um, uh, both transmitted specific knowledge. I remember my mother read to me often when I was growing up and very little. And then I started reading myself, but they also set the, um, set the goals. They suggested that without doubt that I should go on further in schooling and um, were a little bit uh, questioning of what academic people do. They didn't quite understand that, but they were sort of happy that I was continuing to go on to school and use what I learned uh, in my own way. And did they live long enough to see your accomplishments? I've been dead for, for a bit of time. Quite a few of my accomplishments um, um, were, I think, pleased with the fact that I had succeeded. Um, it, it, it's an interesting question to see more as we go into the future. When I was growing up, it was um, very for children to do better than their parents in economic sense, at least. Um, and that's not so uh, obvious anymore. It's not so obvious that children on average do that much better than their parents. Um, and so we'll see what how that changes the social views. Yes. So we're, we're transitioning to talk about your recent paper, the transmission of skills. And uh, I have been looking at it. I'm quite interested in this topic, the intergenerational transmissions, transmission of skills. What do mm -hmm. parents transmit and how do they transmit these skills? Is it via the genetic route or the cultural route? So I think it's both, um, as far as we can tell. As I say, the, the research is a bit imprecise there, but the work we did um, on some uh, families in the Netherlands suggested that both families and schools or, or outside environment were important in uh, the skills that uh, the youth had, so that both elements came into play for certain. We don't know exactly how to parse out the differences, how much which was more important than which and so forth, but we do know that both are important. And we also know that cognitive skills like STEM skills are important. I think so. Um, there's certainly a lot of emphasis on that, in part because STEM, STEM skills are really important to society. Having a, uh, <laughs> having rocket scientists is good for everybody. That they invent new things and uh, that um, is helpful for all of society. Eric, would you say that the cognitive abilities of parents are better at influencing the achievement of their children than socioeconomic status? Um, well, I, those are so locked together, um, sort of achievement and achievement and economic outcomes and social economic status are all locked together. It's, it's really hard to break those apart. Yes, highly intelligent people are usually successful. And Rinderman, he has a paper on the topic, but I think the broader issue is that intellectual people are likely to create environments that are more stimulating. So as one writer notes, even if parent, even if children don't inherit enough of the genetic components, 
if, 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 even if children do not inherit enough of their parents' genes that are associated with educational attainment, if these parents create a stimulating environment, then the children are going to be successful. I think that's right. I mean, it, that's this combination of, of genetics and environment and, and the interaction of them that I think is really important. The article is titled The Powerful Indirect Influence of Genes on Children's Success by Jasmine Wirtz. Uh, so I, I'm, don't, I'm not familiar with that article. Um, uh, I, I just view this all as um, sort of a complicated interaction that we can't break apart very easily. Yeah, Jasmine, she and her co-authors, they actually did a paper because they wanted to explore the relationship between genes, environment, and academic achievement. So in your spare time, I'm, you're going to read it because I know you're always, doing, you're always reading and doing research. So we're wrapping up. And because we're wrapping up, we're going to talk about the second million dollar issue, economic growth and, ed and education. Let me give you my opinion. I'm, I'm big on human capital. What, what, is, what matters is human capital, not the percentage of people with degrees. So I don't care if 50% of your citizens have degrees in engineering. If they're not filing patents, you're not going to see economic growth. So um, I've spent a lot of time in the last 20 or so years, 30 years, I guess now, trying to understand why some countries grow faster than others. And I now come down to a very simple statement that um, <clears throat> the growth of an economy is directly related to the skills of its people. And so this is the human capital that you've talked about, the, the combined skills that people have developed either from families or schools or wherever, but that countries that have more skilled populations simply grow faster. Yes, it's, it's really that simple. I'm a theoretical guy, but at some point in your life, one, one must apply knowledge. So if you do research on IQ and genes, you may work as a policy analyst. The application of knowledge is crucial to economic growth. Saying that people should acquire STEM skills or get degrees in physics and engineering will pose a problem when countries lack the infrastructure. And again, I can talk about J Jamaica because this is where I live. Presently, we're talking a lot about STEM. That's a buzzword. But there are several issues. We know of good data on the relationship between culture and economic growth. We understand the role of curiosity in fostering innovation. And based on what I've read, I do know that Jamaican culture is more embedded than individualistic. And economists, they say that individualism is the most robust predict the most robust cultural predictor of economic performance. And curiosity is also crucial to innovation. And Jam Jamaica is a paradoxical society. It people say that J Jamaicans are Christian but they really like raunchy dancehall music. And although they like raunchy, raunchy dancehall music and they themselves are indeed raunchy, they don't like raunchy shows. So it's a paradoxical society. On the one hand, they're very radical, but on the other hand of the spectrum, they're just too conservative and conservatism has a place in society. But if we want to innovate, there has to be a certain level of con conservatism. We don't want to be too conservative. So the prime minister said recently that he wants Jamaica to be a tech hub. And that was like, well, for it to become a tech hub, it needs to foster a culture of curiosity. And that culture is not quite evident. Students are introduced to this story, Annie Palmer, and many other historical stories. And some of them are, are untrue. They're not real. And I know this, and I know this because of research and articles penned by bloggers, foreign bloggers, but in Jamaica, they're seen as real because of a lack of curiosity. So building a tech hub is quite easy when you have curious people. But if people are not serious about applying knowledge and intellectual stuff, conversations of this nature, then you're going to have a problem. But it's a, it's so, a growing country. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a, I, I like your description of Jamaica and Jamaican culture. Um, one of the things that I take away from that discussion, which 
I firmly believe myself is that um, from a policy standpoint, or at least the policy discussion standpoint, I think that there's too much emphasis on just developing STEM skills. Um, I think that there's a lot to be gained um, throughout uh, society for strong uh, high base level for everybody in society. Um, some of the work that we did in, on growth in the past, in fact, supported that idea. Um, we tried to look at whether it was more important to develop rocket scientists, people with at the top with high STEM skills, et cetera, or was it more important to have um, uniform basic skills, a high level of basic skills? What we found was that both of those were important. It's important to have some people that are really highly trained. It's also important to have a society with broad general skills, but th they interact with each other so that STEM scientists are more productive if they have a skilled workforce to be around them. And that, that I think is the important lesson. Don't say that we'll put all of our eggs into the STEM basket, but in fact, think about improving the skills of the whole society. Yes, you, you have to improve the skills of the entire society. And there's a paper by somebody called R Richard Welsh, and he was comparing Jamaica and Singapore. And the argument is quite simple. Singapore invested in primary, technical, and then tertiary education. In the 70s, Jamaica invested in tertiary education. Many of the beneficiaries would have been able to study at the university level anyway. And today, Jamaicans are talking about early childhood education. That's important, but because we're in an economy that's more competitive now than it was 20 years ago, we need to build the capital infrastructure of universities. But Jamaica made an error in the 70s. It should have followed the it should have followed, it should have followed East Asian countries that were strategic. They knew that they couldn't accommodate a large slurp, surplus of highly educated workers at that time. So they were strategic. They invested in primary, technical, and then tertiary education. Jamaica went the back the other way. And today we're paying the price. Well, you can see that in other countries of the world too. I think that comparison is very good. Um, if you look at um, the education system in India, you see some of the same things where they have some of the top scientists in the world. In fact, I live in Silicon Valley with lots of high tech engineers, many of whom went to the best schools in India and are now working in the US. On the other hand, they didn't invest much in the broad general skills of the population. And I think that's harming them over time. Uh, so um, the the picture of investment that you described for Jamaica also exists in lots of other places of the world, um, in part because you know that those top uh, engineering schools and the top universities are really glittering jewels that people would like to see more of those jewels, but that's not necessarily the way to develop an entire uh, society in an entire country. Investment should be broad based, but well, I, I shouldn't say luckily again, some time ago I was interested in politics, but I don't think I'm a political guy. I'm more of a policy and getting stuff done guy and politicians just like to talk. So no, Professor Eric, I'm not going to enter politics in Jamaica. I, my <laughs> ideas might sound really good, but no, I'm not going to politics. Well, I can't advise you on whether to enter politics or not. Yeah, but working and reading policy papers, whenever I listen to a politician, I, I just become really annoyed. Back to what we said earlier about the tech hub. So, I'm not going um, to. I'm sorry, Lipton, I've lost you.
Laura Lipton. I've completely lost you, I'm sorry. You can see it in real time with a girl. Now so we talk about a recommended point and shoot. We do have these aboard the ships. Planning power shot SS7. 